Thank you for having us. Uh, it's always great to come to LACNIC, even remotely. Uh, I'm Jose uh, uh, from Meta, also formerly known as Facebook. And today, along with Elena, we are presenting our perspective on the evolution of the network engineering role. Uh, next slide, please. If we go back into the past, uh, perhaps a few decades ago when I started my career as a network engineer, one of the many questions I had was around what was the core knowledge needed to be successful? Uh, what was going to help me do most of the projects that would come my way? And what was essentially critical versus just a nice to have? And although I don't know if I ever looked as happy as the person on this slide, um, I ended up developing this knowledge with experience, uh, trial and error, and the available resources I had at the time. So um, let's explore what some of those skills are. Next slide, please. So if we oversimplify, it looked a little bit like this. Um, there were some critical intersections between these three domains, um, protocols, topologies, and how they are normally used on the internet or in typical enterprise environments. Next slide, please. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. First of all, thank you for having us. Uh, it's always great to come to LACNIC, even remotely. Uh, I'm Jose uh, uh, from Meta, also formerly known as Facebook. And today, along with Elena, we are presenting our perspective on the evolution of the network engineering role. Uh, next slide, please. If we go back into the past, uh, perhaps a few decades ago when I started my career as a network engineer, one of the many questions I had was around what was the core knowledge needed to be successful? Uh, what was going to help me do most of the projects that would come my way? And what was essentially critical versus just a nice to have? And although I don't know if I ever looked as happy as the person on this slide, um, I ended up developing this knowledge with experience, uh, trial and error, and the available resources I had at the time. So um, let's explore what some of those skills are. Next slide, please. So if we oversimplify, it looked a little bit like this. Um, there were some critical intersections between these three domains, um, protocols, topologies, and how they are normally used on the internet or in typical enterprise environments. Next slide, please. Depending on the type of role, these other three skills were also fundamental. And these are the concepts of power, space, and cooling, what redundancies we could have or we should have at different layers, and what the hardware could and could not do. Next slide, please. So, so oversimplifying again, those cover most of what a typical network engineer needs to know to be effective. But what's the difference um, when we are operating at scale? what's different in an environment such as Metas. To describe this better, I always like to call out um, some of the fun myths that exist about scale. And I have a few, but for the sake of time, I will only cover one with a few examples. Next slide. And this is the myth that big networks have fixed everything. I would love for this to be true. Next slide. And that I look like this every day, but the reality is a bit different, and if you ask me, uh, more interesting and more challenging. Next slide. So if we look at this graph, which comes from a book that is humbly called How to Change the World, this graph uh, shows an adoption curve. So if we look at it from left to right, most environments such as ours are typically doing projects in one of these first three sections, right? This is the initiators, innovators, or early adopters. The reasons for this are varied, but they come down to the fact that when you have thousands of anything, any optimization becomes extremely meaningful. And new technologies enable new possibilities, which are we are always evaluating as they present opportunities to shift some of the trade-offs that we had to make historically when we were building the network ecosystem. Next slide, please. One of the consequences caused by this is that the network keeps changing and it rarely looks as a monolith. We have a varied ecosystem that has many permutations of network hardware and network operating systems. 
um, since those essentially fulfill different business needs for different spaces in the network. And I know this sounds somewhat, somewhat abstract. Um, let's talk about a few real world examples that hopefully can add some color to it. Next slide. Keeping in mind this diverse network ecosystem I was just describing, let's um, talk about how we would get information out of the devices, right? The vital stats that we need are mostly universal and they feed almost all of our automation. They provide the ongoing telemetry that is used to run the network. But depending on what uh, network OS you're using, there are uh, a multitude of ways that you can uh, interact with them. There are some of the classics that are here, like uh, SNMP and TL1. There are some that are more uh, modern, such as Thrift or gRPC, or basically whatever your favorite uh, vendor is calling streaming telemetry these days. But the fact of the matter remains that this presents a non-trivial challenge for the teams that are operating these fleets. There needs to be a comprehensive and modular set of frameworks that allow extensibility, control, and a support for a multitude of ways of interacting with the devices. And you know, please keep in mind that we are really only talking about read operations. We're just talking about getting telemetry of how the devices are performing uh, at any given point. Next slide, please. And of course, we want to be able to do this without having to scrape the CLI um, with regexes for everything, right? Um, Next slide, please. The same challenge is present when we think about another common operation in the life cycle of any platform or any network product, which would be upgrades. Uh, similar to the data collection from before, different operating systems will have different ways of doing upgrades with significant constraints attached to that process. Those constraints can range from simply how do you preload new code to the complexities involved in removing traffic from the device and ensuring it is healthy before bringing that traffic back. Next slide, please. And my last example is a little bit more difficult. And here the use case is software that probes the network to detect uh, broken devices. This will be systems that use uh, some capability um, to essentially determine are we doing what we expect to do um, using synthetic traffic? The complexities involved here, um, you know, there are many, but for example, hardware data forwarding, which will be different depending on platform, and it will be different sometimes in the same platform, just depending on, um, you know, the different line cards that we have and like how they uh, interact with each other. Uh, on top of things like the control plane policing, make building and maintaining these solutions uh, challenging. And overall, these are just a few small subset of examples uh, for use cases that I believe aren't really universally solved in big networks that any network engineer will have to wrestle with today and in the future. And with that, I hand off to Elena to discuss how we are bridging those gaps with our engineers. Thanks, Jose. All right, so as Jose said, um, the, this part of the presentation is gonna be focused on, let's say that you want to join a large scale uh, network and what are the things that we have seen that we have observed through interview process through people joining uh, the teams so we always see okay here are some gaps so what are those gaps how do they manifest so let's start with um, the first one the first one that we see is that people in the traditional role maybe they don't use software on a day-to-day -day basis it's maybe not part of their core uh, role so that is manifested in the struggles with you know writing reliable code code that can be deployed at scale and 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 the way to do that that's the first the second one would be having this surface knowledge of uh, fundamentals like networking fundamentals mm -hmm. like i don't know tcp ip or mm -hmm. even like UTP and different protocols and the the problem with this or the gap that we see is that when there is a struggle when it comes to applying those fundamentals to solve problems at scale for example it's different uh, if you want to design a topology just to connect uh, i don't know dozen devices versus million so the third one is kind of related to what jose was saying about monitoring and troubleshooting when you have a small network, maybe you do a lot of things manually because it's fast, makes sense. But the problem with that is the missed um, opportunity to use automation to standardize the way you gather data. 
and the things that you can do with that, the problems that you can solve. So automation it definitely is something that people really want to do, but they might not do it because sometimes it has a, a upfront cost. So that's that's true. So what are the ideas? So you know, if you really want to join uh, a company with the scale like this, um, what can you start uh, doing or learning, or what do you have to have in mind? From the point of view of like interviewing or joining or your first day in a company. Um, so the first thing is, you know, being more comfortable or actually using automation on a day to day basis as much as possible to try solve problems that you have. Right. And that would also make you be more familiar with unit testing, integration tests and how to make this code, this script that you're writing more reliable. The other idea is to get comfortable with any programming language that can help you solve problems, right? So using software to tackle something uh, that you might need to do this at scale. So for example, Python, C++, Rust. And it's not just about learning a particular language, but understanding what are the use cases that the language is solving for, how a particular language can help you gather data, process the data, create a data pipeline, and so on. And the other thing would be in terms of the protocols and the networking knowledge. Um, one suggestion would be to really learn, um, I don't know, for example, like BGP or any protocol that you like and understand what are the limitations, the, the use cases, how you know how you can actually apply it in the real uh, world, if possible. So then you can get more um, hands-on experience. And finally, we recommend some books here, um, <laughs> for example, Clean Code, How to Measure Anything, uh, think Python and network programmability and automation. So these are kind of starting points. If today you're watching this and you're like, okay, so how do you know, where do I start? These are kind of uh, some of the books, but these are things that um, you can do and things that you can do as in like when you need and when you have time, I'm going to talk about what we are trying to do because we see that gap and we really want to bridge it. So we have developed these career defining programs and one of them, especially for the network is called the Rotational Network Engineering Program, which is a program I lead. And the idea of the program is to give engineers enough time and exposure to get used to the you know, different tools that we have, the protocols that we use, the frameworks that we have to do all of the things that Jose was also talking about, like monitoring, uh, upgrading and, and so on. And the idea is that with these programs, people can, um, really learn and have hands-on experience before they go and join a team. So hopefully by the end of the program, uh, all the network engineers can uh, you know, hit their ground running. And that also means that we are in a way trying to boost their career progression um, at the very, very uh, early stage. Finally, we also try to find this raw talent, uh, this combination of skills, which is very, very hard sometimes to find people with networking knowledge, uh, coding skills, and early, uh, kind of like early in their careers. So we also give them uh, an opportunity through internships so they can uh, get that exposure to a large scale network. And this is how these kind of programs are structured. So in this particular case, uh, we have a, a phase for um, people to work on different tasks and then they can go deep into a domain with a, a graduation project. Um, other things that we do, and they are kind of related to working at scale and we're also working on a company like this, is to understand how to do time management, documentation, communication, how to even like interview other people and so on. And finally, uh, for you know, what we also discover is that to make someone very successful, uh, we need to provide more support. So we have a lot of mentors and we try to model success through them um, and also like informing uh, their future career, like where do they want to um, you know, work next as in within, <laughs> within Meta. And uh, with that, uh, that's it. So thank you very much for uh, listening to our presentation and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Elena and Jose, for that presentation. Now I want to invite Jorge Villa, who will help us uh, uh, chair the uh, questions and those in the room and in the Q&A panel. I correct myself. He's going, Guillermo Sicileo is going to help us. Not. Uh, do we have any questions? No, I don't see any so far. I don't know whether there's anybody in the room. If you want to come uh, close to the mic. Uh, 
are no questions in the Q&A either. So thank you, Jose and Elena. A round of applause for them.